Welcome to Thilmatic Life with Moo. My name is Moo, and today's podcast is an essay that I wrote called Women's Spirituality, Everyday Holy Women Redefining Religion. As women become empowered in their professional and personal lives, they tend to redefine their religious beliefs as well. Often, spiritual ideals and beliefs that are based on a patriarchal model of theology no longer feel right. Freedom from prejudicial and oppressive standards feels right. These days, we see a lot of newer religious movements with a more holistic approach to spirituality, an ideal that does not discriminate or exclude the female face of deity. In addition to nature and ecology movements, there is a renewed interest in and revival of the goddess archetype. Some people believe that the women of the feminist spiritual movements are ushering in the new feminine age of Aquarius with the goddess taking her rightful place beside the masculine god of the patriarchal era. Women are clearly the catalyst for the formation of this new spiritual paradigm. Among other goals, feminist spirituality aims to bring about the end of patriarchy and the politics of separation in religion. In a keynote address given at the International Conference on Women's Spirituality, Betty Sue Flowers said, quote, The goddess is a metaphor that reminds us of the female side of spirituality. Metaphors are important. You can't know God directly. You can only know images of God, and each image or metaphor is a door. Some doors are open and others are closed. A door that is only male is only half open. In response to the problems of patriarchal oppression, Mary Daly, a Christian feminist, put it bluntly when she said, Christianity itself should be castrated. Throughout history, there have been many women who have dedicated their lives to opening the door all of the way for women in religion. These movers and shakers laid the groundwork enabling today's feminist-based spirituality movement. In America, women like Anne Hutchinson, an outspoken, quote, female in a male hierarchy, and the first woman preacher in the colonies, was tried for blasphemy and banished to another state for the crime of meeting with women in her home where she taught that, quote, laws, commands, rules, and edicts are for those who have not the light which makes plain the pathway. She who has God's grace in her heart cannot go astray, end quote. Later, Hutchinson's principles of religious freedom and civil liberties were written into the Constitution of the United States. In 1776, at the age of 25, Jemima Wilkinson became the first American woman to found a religious group. She called it the Universal Friends and renamed herself Public Friend. This occurred after she had had a near-death experience and a vision where she was embraced by what she described as an omnipotent light force. Like most other people who have had near-death experiences, she returned to life transformed and said that she was on a mission from God. She preached pacifism and began faith healing and prophesying, which resulted in a public attack and stoning where she, when she was in Philadelphia. Obviously, society wasn't ready for Jemima, but a hundred years later, Mary Baker Eddy followed in her footsteps and founded the Christian Science Church, which is based on the body-mind-spirit connection and also embraces faith healing. It's important to remember that many of the women who founded or became involved in so-called radical religious movements did so after having mystical experiences that changed their perceptions. For example, the 19th century American woman known as Sojourner Truth, her name was Isabella Van Wagner, was born into slavery, but emancipated herself in 1820 by running away from her owner. After mystical revelations, including one where she said that she saw God everywhere, she became a preacher and a political activist. Hildegard von Bingen is another well-known example that we are mostly aware of today because of Matthew Fox, a Catholic priest who advocates equality in the church and a return to honoring the earth. 
Hildegard was a 12th century European nun who produced an impressive body of written and musical work during her lifetime. She had her first mystical vision at the age of three, but it was a vision she had 39 years later that changed the course of her life. She described the vision as, the heavens were opened and a blinding light of exceptional brilliance flowed through my entire brain. She said that with her visions, it was as if in an instant I learn what I know. She taught that the earth was alive and that everyone was able to experience the divine without the intercession of a priest. At that time in history, one might think that penance for such a radical idea would be expulsion from the church. To the contrary, Hildegard's works on theology, music, and natural history were so remarkable that it earned her the respect of bishops, popes, and kings. Laura Armistad Chant, though she never claimed to have had any visions, was also a visionary in her own right. In 1893, she gave a now famous speech at the Parliament of World's Religions in Chicago, where she spoke of religious tolerance, one God, and nature as the great educator. Perhaps all women are mystics at their core. In her book, Creation of the Feminist Consciousness, Gerda Lerner wrote, Mysticism is an alternate mode of thought to patriarchal thinking, Mystics see human beings, the world, and universe in a state of relatedness, open to understanding by intuitive and immediate perception. Author Patricia Hunt Perry, in her book The Wise Woman in the Western Tradition, explains that after experiencing profound mystical revelations, many women, though quite transformed, return or remain at home with their families and live ordinary lives. After all, as Annie Besant wrote, all work done in the world is God's work. Spirituality doesn't depend upon the environment. It depends on one's attitude toward life. In a small group of women that I interviewed, most reflected learning, Lerner, Perry, and Besant's ideas. Eleven women, ranging in age from 30 to 59 years old, responded to an email survey I sent out. Obviously, 11 interviews aren't meant to represent a scientific or impartial consensus of women, but I did see some interesting similarities in thought and spiritual ideas. When asked if they consider themselves to be religious, 8 out of the 11 said no. However, they considered themselves to be very spiritual. Of the three who said they were religious, two are members of a traditional Christian church, and one is pagan. One of the three, Carla, calls herself a Christian mystic and attends church regularly. She said that she has always believed in Jesus because as a baby she played with him in her room. Shelley said that she's religious because Jesus gave her unconditional love and filled an emptiness inside of her that she didn't even know was there. When asked if religion is an important part of her life, Shelley responded, Everyone needs something to believe in. What else is there? Of all of the respondents who were once affiliated with traditional Christian churches, each of them said that they left their church because they felt the restrictive dogma didn't allow them to fully explore or express their ideas of spirituality, to the extent that they intuitively knew was possible. Many said that the church wasn't able to adequately answer their questions, so they set out on their own individual spiritual quest. Regardless of whether these women considered themselves to be religious or not, all respondents said that spiritual or religious belief is a very important part of their life. It's more than just a belief or a practice, it's who they feel they are. Carla said, it's what I am here to be. Julia said, it's her basic way of being. Lynn said it is simply a way of life. Sarah said, it is the core of her life and the lens through which she views her life, it gives it shape and meaning. When asked about transcendent or transforming religious or spiritual experiences, all of the women I interviewed said they had had at least one in their lifetime. Most have had several. The experiences included out-of-body and altered states, as were described as a sense of connection to the whole and a feeling of expansion. As with a shaman's experience, Amy said, 
I have flown with birds and talked to trees. I have felt like a shining vortex of energy blended with the total cosmos. I have dreamed presences. Ten of the women I interviewed, and many others, have rejected the patriarchal religions of the world, not so much to join feminist or matriarchal type of institutionalized religions, but because they found traditional world religions too restrictive and not broad enough in scope to encompass their beliefs. Their spiritual understanding is much more universal and inclusive than most religious doctrine would allow. All but one woman realized her own divinity. Ten out of the eleven described God in a similar way, using descriptions such as an intelligent animating life force present in all things in the universe, and both creator and all that is created, all there is, everything, emotion, thought, feeling, experience, and shadow. Sarah said that her idea of God is the ground of all existence, the intelligent self-aware matrix that contains and interpenetrates all things. Lynn said that God couldn't be described or understood, but is what each of us and everything that exists on every level is composed of. She says, we are God. In addition to recognizing these same attributes, Romy added, my God loves chocolate. Julia related her impression of God as the orange ball of energy that so reflected love to her that she knew she'd seen into the mirror and known herself as God and love. Over and over, I heard a very Taoist description of God, which is described wonderfully by Shirley Nicholson in her essay, The Way of the Uncarved Block. Nicholson wrote, the mother of the world, the Tao, is the elusive, invisible, inaudible, unfathomable ground which embraces both forms and the formless. It is all-pervading, all-embracing, everywhere and all things. Specific daily rituals were not very important to the women I interviewed. However, some said that they made time for meditation, prayer, or quiet time when needed. Their spirituality is expressed in many ways and actions, but mostly it's a way of being in the world that is as integral to their lives as breathing, eating, and sleeping. There's no delineation between their life and their spirituality. It's one thing. These women and others, past and present, are shaping a new type of religion that begins and ends within, yet ultimately affects everyone and everything like a ripple on the planetary pond. According to Merlin Stone, author of When God Was a Woman, the disenthronement of the great goddess, begun by the Indo-European invaders, was finally accomplished by the Hebrew, Christian, and Muslim religions that arose later. The male deity took the prominent place. The female goddesses faded into the background and women in society followed suit. Years of patriarchal religions and literal interpretations of the Bible have traditionally supported the patriarchal view of the world and played a big part in the oppression of women. So, it's not surprising that we are seeing feminist-type religious movements and ideals that promote equality and freedom and deity that is both masculine and feminine. As women question the old patriarchal ideas and realize their inherent worth and connection with creation, they are breathing the very life back into the goddess of the old, the goddess of the new feminine era. For centuries, there have been examples of women who fought for the freedom to express spirituality in unstructured ways, and some of us are still fighting for that right for every woman and man on earth. Bishop John Shelby Spong, in his book Born of a Woman, writes, The literalized Bible in general and the birth narratives that turn on the person of the Virgin in particular are guilty of aiding and abetting the sexist prejudice that continues to live and distort women. This is not a new revelation, but rather profound coming from a bishop. The tradition of feminist Bible criticism goes back as far as the 3rd century AD, according to author Gerda Lerner, as she points out that it is no trivial point. 
there was much repetitive effort of women criticizing and reinterpreting the Bible because they were not aware it had been done previously. In fact, Lerner writes that current feminist Bible criticism is going over the same territory and using the same arguments that have been used for centuries by other women. She believes it's the very essence of the different relationship men and women have to historical process. While men have had the advantage of being able to stand on the shoulders of giants, which is, by the way, a quote attributed to Isaac Newton, but was actually coined by French philosopher Bernard de Chartres, C-H-A-R-T-R-E-S. As, a major, as major concepts of Western civili civilization were shaped and formed by the men who wrote the history and transmitted the knowledge generation to generation, women have had to use their energy to reinvent the wheel over and over again. The men were able to argue with the men the giants who preceded them, while women argued against the oppression of a thousand years of patriarchal thought, which denied them authority, even humanity. Women are still fighting patriarchal oppression, but with the internet and other forms of modern communication, we're able to share our religious concepts and spiritual ideas with one another across the globe. The female thinkers and theologians of tomorrow will be aware of the women's shoulders they stand on and countless nameless others. Women of the feminist spirituality are not unlike the 12th and 13th century Northern European Beguines. Beguines was originally a derogatory label for a female heretic. The Beguines were women who sought an unstructured, non-hierarchical spiritual life. They were also known as Umiliati, in southern Europe. They didn't want their choices to be limited to becoming only a wife or a nun. They wanted a life that included daily spiritual practice, work, and the freedom to discuss ideas amongst themselves. It was a spontaneous movement that had no founder and no legislator. Many of these women were mystics and were simply referred to as holy women. They had multiple lifestyles and supported different paths to the same goal, which was spiritual enlightenment. A similar modern movement is occurring in the Jewish community. Many of the women refer to themselves as the midwives for the rebirth of the Shekinah. The Shekinah is the female aspect of God. They consider their Jewish goddess to be a varied goddess with a thousand faces. As with the Beguines, the Jewish goddess movement has no hierarchy, no central leader, and is not limited to a single organization. Author Rabbi Leah Novik describes the movement as coming from the subterranean parts of the human psyche, which is a place of discovery, wonder, awe, and worship. Whether they are aware of it or not, most of the women I interviewed fall into the category of being part of the feminist spirituality movement. In her book, Feminism, A Vision of Love, Shar McKee writes, As the feminist spirituality movement expands, more and more women will be inspired to transform their pain and their rage and their mourning for the world into loving, affirming actions, into what Buddhists call moral action. In this interim time, the bridge between the old and the new, the suffering of all creation is coming in more into conscious awareness so that we may know it as the consequence of patriarchal beliefs, values, and behavior. It will be the power of love as expressed through the political ramifications of this mystical vision to finally manifest on the earth. The wisdom of women's experience will at last generate the ideals of social justice, environmental harmony, and peaceful, loving relations to inform our daily lives in the new age. Gerda Lerner wrote of the women back in 1842, Despite all the gender indoctrination and the intense pressure towards submissiveness, women, obsessed or rational, wrote themselves into the story of redemption. They would speak to God, represent the divine, give birth to the redeemer, assert the feminine element in the divinity and usurp by ecstatic vision, mad inspiration, simple faith, or any means they could muster, the right to define the divine and with it the right to define their own humanity. 
and we are still at it. Perhaps our voices will be heard so that the women of our future need not fight for the same freedoms. Women's search for an expression of the divine and a spirituality that, that transcends differences of every kind continues. A deeply inspiring spirituality that is found in the most unlikely and humble places. It is found in the homes, hearts, and lives of women whose names are not likely to be recorded in the books of history, even though they have forever changed the world for the better with each divine breath they took. Mm -hmm.